Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of History Quest. I am your one and only and favorite host, Brian Haynes, director of the McLeod County Historical Society. And uh, this week I've got a story for you, some museum news and some undeniable truth. So stay tuned. There may be no greater portrayal of the early settler experience than that of the covered wagon. With a wild landscape sprawled before it, people and livestock walking alongside of it and moving stalwartly toward the western horizon, the covered wagon carried sturdy men and women down the winding prairie trails to a new life filled with hope and dreams of a better future. Today, with highways and air travel bringing us to and fro, it is sometimes hard to even imagine what it was like for our ancestral counterparts to travel across the country. In 1930, Carlos Avery, who grew up on a Hutchinson farm in the 1870s, jotted down his boyhood recollections of traveling across the countryside at a time when cars, trucks, and airplanes were little more than a fantasy. The following are excerpts from his recollection. It should be remembered that at a time, though some 30 railroad companies have been incorporated and proposed lines have been projected, there was not a highway worthy of the name. The navigable rivers, the Mississippi and the Minnesota, and even a number of lesser streams were the only real highways. Eager hosts of home seekers, land speculators, traders, and the usual complement of camp followers and adventurers poured into St. Paul. But the greater number of people pushed into and through the big woods to stake their claims. During those years of early settlement, travel from the head of navigation was often by hastily assembled and improvised equipment, usually led by ox team. The trails, by courtesy called roads, led through a quagmire in the forest and skirted the margins of marsh and slough on the prairie. A graded road was unknown. Bridges were unheard of. Streams were forded, sometimes with disastrous results to passengers and cargo. The difficulties of travel under such conditions were all but insurmountable. Tales are told of loading and unloading time and again as the outfits became bogged down, carrying bags of potatoes or grain, farm implements, food, furniture, or what have you that might constitute the cargo. Through swampy places where even the empty wagon made a load, the tired oxen could scarcely budge unless the owner added his own burly shoulder to the motive power. The wagons were heavy, springless, and seldom equipped with a spring seat. The driver and other passengers sat on boards laid across the top of the wagon box, or on the floor behind it if they rode at all. They usually had to work their passage. The wagon box was piled full of the family possessions of which there was no great variety, with odds and ends tied on the outside. Boughs of bent wood were fastened to the box on each side over which was stretched a canvas cover forming a water and windproof shelter. The rear end of the cover was drawn together with a puckering string which could on occasion be loosened so as to admit access to the inside of the wagon from the rear. In the front, the flap was tied back to permit the driver to have an unobstructed view. As I recall it, tents were seldom, if ever used, in camping at night. The people slept on the ground under the wagon, or sometimes in the wagon, if there was room. Smudge from the campfire was the only protection from mosquitoes, and mosquitoes in those days seemed to be a thousand times more numerous and more fierce than they are today. When on the way, the family or passengers usually walked beside or behind the wagon where also trailed the family livestock, consisting in the case of more opulent, usually of one lone, emancipated cow. A dog or two made up the sum total of the animal possessions and of the majority. Of children, there were few, as most of these adventurers were young. And even if in a family group, there had not been time to accumulate a flock. Babes in the arms there were and sturdy young women who came to strive shoulder to shoulder with their husbands, brothers, or sweethearts. Those pioneers who blazed the way for hordes who were to follow were our first immigrants. The first to introduce the prairie schooner or covered wagon, the emigrant wagon as we called it, 
which is for many years to mark the migration of America across the continent. Well, that was our story. Um, I hope you enjoyed the story. I, I certainly enjoyed writing it. I came across it in the uh, archives, and uh, I don't know, it was just a hit for me instantly. So I really hope you enjoyed it. Impeaching a former president. Is it constitutional, or are we just throwing rotten peaches at a president? That and more coming up next. <laughs> In a world of fake news, where the facts are sometimes altered, we bring you the undeniable truth with Brian Haynes. Hello, America, and welcome to another installment of the undeniable truth. There's been a lot going on in the world since we spoke last. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think you all know that uh, we have members of our federal government um, namely in Congress and some senators, and they are looking to impeach a former president. Um, that has never been done in the history of the United States. And not, not only are they, I shouldn't say they're looking to impeach him, he's already been on the impeachment stand. They are looking to oust him. Um, I'm not sure how that works since he's already out, and we're not sure if it's constitutional or not constitutional. And I'm also not sure why they call it an impeachment. When I think of an impeachment, I think of a peach, right? A peach, like a, a Georgia peach. And so, so why do we call it an impeachment? And why has nobody else noticing this in America? And why is nobody else tackling this in America? I mean, when you say impeachment, I think, do we put the president in the in the stocks and do we throw rotten peaches and other fruits at him? What is the deal here? There is a move in the United States to eliminate um, current student debt. Uh, they're, they're talking about $10,000 to $50,000 in student debt that could be forgiven for people who owe federal student loans at this moment. Um, I, don't, I can't say whether that is a good thing or whether that's a bad thing. If you owe student debt, I'm pretty sure you're going to feel it's a good thing. If you have already paid your student debt, I'm pretty sure you're going to feel it's a bad thing. Nonetheless, if this is an unprecedented moment in our history as a nation, um, there, there's certainly going to be some kind of repercussion for doing this, and there's also certainly going to be some kind of gain for doing this. Um, I think the, the big thing, though, you know, from a historical perspective, is that this is definitely something to watch for. This is, or not watch for, but watch in general. This is something to watch because we someday are going to be looking back on this time, um, you know, if and when this happens, and uh, it's going to be in the history books. Um, so it's definitely worth watching. All right. So as I've said before, um, it, it's hard these days to tell what's true and what's not true in America. Um, however, as promised, I have five undeniable truths of history right in front of me, and we will run through them right now. The first undeniable truth that I'm going to tell you about is the runaway elephant. I'll read what they put in front of me here. On the 21st of July, 1950, Circus director Franz Althoff had Tufi, then a four-year-old Indian elephant, take on the monorail in Wuppertal as a marketing gag. So he you know, brought it around to different places and they could see this elephant. Um, the elephant apparently did not think this was funny and did not like it. Tufi trumpeted wildly and ran through the wagon, broke through a window, and jumped off the local monorail and fell some 39 feet down into the Whooper River. She lived another 40 years to tell the tale. It's an interesting fact from history. Another interesting fact, um, you've probably seen people with sideburns. Sideburns are a very uh, a staple of, of men's fashion. Um, you can, you can grow them however you want, you can style them, you can braid them, I suppose, if they were long enough. But at any rate, you've all seen sideburns. The origin of sideburns and where the name comes from is from Ambrose Everett Burnside, who was an American soldier during the Civil War. Actually, he was a general during the Civil War. Um, if you ever watch any documentaries or study it, his name will come up often. Uh, he had a unique facial hair, though, that it was a style that led to sideburns and big, big, burly sideburns on it. Well, since his name was Burnside, they decided to call them Sideburns. So that's a good fact to know. You can, you can impress people at the next party with that one. Okay. The third undeniable fact of history that I have is human zoos. 
Selknam natives being transported to Europe to be put on display as animals in human zoos. Now this is right at the turn of the century. What's even more unbelievable is that more than a hundred years later, scores of women and children are still being sold as slaves today by extremist militant groups in the Middle East. Uh, we, we like to think that slavery has been eradicated, but in fact, it really has not. It's still happening today. Uh, and as we look at our past and question our past with slavery, it's a good thing to know that uh, it is no longer legal in the United States, um, but it does happen around the world and very likely maybe even here in the United States, uh, maybe a little bit differently than, than what we've seen in the past, in our nation's past, but it still does exist. However, um, it, it's almost unfathomable to, to, to think about that uh, people were put in zoos, that natives um, from, from other parts of the world were brought into Europe and put in a cage for others to gawk at. Um, tragic, tragic. My next undeniable truth is called when money is worthless. Using banknotes as wallpaper and building rocks during hyperinflation in Germany, um, then called the Weimar Republic in 1923. And now a little bit of background from that. Um, after the end of World War I, the uh, Allies put together a government in Germany because in, during World War I in Germany you have a um, you have a basically an emperor, um, king, if you will, and uh, he, he runs everything. Well, once the war is over, he is disposed of. Well, not disposed of, but he's taken. He's no longer in power. And uh, so what you have is the allies who won the war and have uh, basically taken over this part of Europe, install their own government in there called the Weimar Republic. Um, it's important to know, actually, that the Weimar Republic was uh, supposed to be the model of democracy, that you had the West putting together this government that um, was, was a very, very liberal democracy. And when I say liberal democracy, I don't mean it in the sense of uh, left-leaning or anything like that. Um, I, I just mean that uh, everybody, criminals, um, everybody ha had the right to vote, and uh, they are considered one of the most um, liberal democracies in history. And, and again, that doesn't mean liberal left-wing like we would refer to it today. Um, at any rate, the Allies imposed on Germany, or the Weimar Republic, that they would have to pay back damages done during World War I. And um, essentially what it did was just, it, it ruined Germany um, to go along with that, the global depression, you know, the Great Depression that was that was hitting that nation just like every other nation. And then on top of that, they have to pay the, this money back to the Allies, to France, to, to, to Britain, all these people who fought against them. And uh, it just, it, it, it made them, it, it destroyed them really. And so the answer was to just print more money. Let's just print more money. Let's put money out there into the public. And uh, when you do that, the money eventually becomes worthless. Um, it's, you know, there's, especially if there's nothing to back it, you know, if you're not using gold or silver or anything like that. Now, I'm not saying we should go back to the gold standard or anything like that, but what I am saying was in Germany in 1923, nothing was backing the money and the money was just being printed and it was becoming worthless. And so rather than use the money, people who were using it as uh, building blocks, you know, using stacks of it as building blocks and they were using it to wallpaper their houses, um, probably using it to start fires or, or anything else. Uh, you know, we've all seen the guy with a hundred dollar bill lighting his cigar. Well, maybe that was actually happening at the Weimar Republic. Um, but at any rate, the rest of that story, of course, is tragic because uh, the, the Weimar Republic did, in a sense, allow for the Nazis to come into power. And uh, we're not going to go down that road today because uh, that would take me at least an hour to, to explain, and we just don't have that much time. My fifth undeniable truth for you today is uh, life before the polio vaccination. And this is interesting now that we are going through this COVID-19 era. Um, prior to that, um, polio, you know, and this is back in the early part of the 20th century, was a big threat in America. Um, and, and what uh, they would do is they would put these, you know, it really affected children, and they put them in the iron lung. And uh, before the advent of the vaccination, 
An iron lung was a form of medical ventilator that enables a person to breathe uh, when normal muscles can't control that, that action anymore. Um, it almost, you look at the pictures, it's almost like a horror story, but this was a, uh, an actual thing during the polio, polio times. So. That is all I have for you this month. I hope you enjoyed this segment, and I hope you will be back next month. Um, we will have some more undeniable truths and uh, some more um, future historical uh, things to talk about. So, good day. Um, in other news, we, we've had a few things going on at the museum. Uh, same things that have been going on for about the last year. Uh, when I give museum news, I kind of feel like I'm a broken record um, of sorts, but at any rate, um, the barn that I've talked about in the past, uh, our, our timber framed barn that's being built in our new addition, is nearly finished, will be finished within the next couple of days. Um, so as soon as that addition opens up, which again should be very soon, within a month or two, um, I really urge you to come and see it. Uh, our volunteers have worked really hard on this thing and it looks great and uh, it's, it's just a it's a real testament to, uh, not, not to just McLeod County history and the importance of agriculture, but to how hard these volunteers really work down there. So I can't thank them enough and uh, you, can, you can thank them by coming and seeing it and enjoying it. So. Um, also, the mural is uh, nearly finished. Again, I've said that before, um, but I, I've, seen, I've seen the mural and there's just a few small touches left to go, so that'll be going up. Um, and then the blocks, too, that go along with the mural, uh, just, uh, just a review. You can buy a block on the wall and have the name of your farm or the name of a relative who was a farmer um, or the name of a family farm that may no longer be with you. You can have that put on a block and it's called our legacy wall and so that'll stay there forever and just kind of you know provide a little bit of history of some of the farming families in the community. The blocks are $100 and you can purchase one by calling the museum as 320-587-2109 and uh, talking with our uh, secretary and she'll get all your information down and we'll get that block painted up for you. So if you've ever been to the museum before um, and gone through our existing exhibit hall, you've probably noticed that we had a barn sitting in there. Well, since we're building this new barn in the addition, we'll be emptying out the old barn and putting a new um, exhibit in there. Or, uh, excuse me, not an exhibit, but a new display inside of that old barn. And right now we're kind of thinking about a saloon, so that should be kind of interesting. Um, you can come down and check that out. We should have that done here soon also. Um, otherwise, we are open again now that the, uh, the, the restrictions for, you know, if we can be open or can't be open have been lifted. So we are open again. We're at 25% capacity, um, but that is a large number for us. So uh, don't, you shouldn't have to worry about it unless we have like, you know, 150 people in there at once. And I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, you can feel free to come down. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4, Saturday from 1 to 4 and uh, just you know practice safe social distancing and uh, you know use your common sense if you're if you're sick or feeling sick you know stay home but otherwise please do come down and and uh, take advantage of all that we have to offer so that was our show for this month um, I hope you enjoyed it um, we do have some undeniable truth coming up after this so uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll see you next month thank you <music>